Okay, so this is joint work with uh, Victoria Wright. And uh, the whole talk is about uh, how different notions of non-classicality and for multi-qubit systems specifically are logically related to each other. So there's contextuality and entanglement. Those are the two I focus on. Um, but there are others, obviously. So, so the, the, the focus of the talk is multi-qubit systems, so n-qubit systems, where n is whatever finite number of qubits. And um, um, so you can think about a composite notion of non-classicality, something like entanglement. So you need at least two systems to meaningfully talk about entanglement. Uh, Bell's theorem, you need at least two parties doing some uh, local measurements to talk about it. So these are composite notions of non-classicality. Um, these are notions that apply even if you have, for example, a Qtrid, a single system which uh, cannot be thought of as two uh, systems, right? So basically, prime dimensions. So, so this is, uh, the first is Gleason's theorem. I'll explain what that means uh, as we go on, if you don't know. And something called Cochin Specker theorem, which is what corresponds to contextuality. It's a proof of contextuality. And we will look at the interplay of these uh, notions of non classicality in the context of multi qubit systems. Okay? So, concepts. So, first concept, entanglement. I guess I don't really need to introduce that here, except to say that, okay, so firstly, of course, that's the definition of entangled state, is not what I'm going to need so much. But uh, entangled measurement, so I'll call a measurement entangled when at least one of the eigenstates is entangled. So I'm only thinking of pure projective measurements. So um, whenever an eigenstate in your measurement basis is entangled, I call it an entangled measurement. So, so that means when I talk about unentangled measurements, there are different types of unentangled measurements. There are local measurements, so the product measurements that you do in a Bell scenario, for example. You can do these without communication. There are adaptive uh, uh, LOCC type measurements where I, Alice makes a measurement, sends an outcome to Bob, and depending on the outcome, Bob does some measurement, for example. So that's an adaptive kind of measurement. Uh, but you can also have unentangled measurements that are global in a sense. So these are non-adaptive. You cannot implement them with LOCC. They're kind of like separable operations that are not LOCC. Uh, so, but they also don't require entanglement. That's kind of interesting there. So this distinction between LO and the other kinds of measurements will become relevant later. So that's why I'm just mentioning that now. Uh, and Bell's theorem, um, uh, I, all I need is for you to recognize that Bell's theorem is a statement that product measurements on some entangled state can violate Bell inequalities uh, that is achieve correlations that you cannot achieve with classical shared randomness. I'm not going to say much more, but that's basically what Bell's theorem is, right? Um, Okay, Gleason's theorem. I'll spend a little bit more time on this because this may be a bit less known. So uh, Gleason's theorem, essentially, the, the conceptual core of the theorem says that the structure of measurements in quantum theory, projective measurements in quantum theory, gives you the structure of states. Uh, so it basically proves the Born rule if you start with the structure of projective measurements in quantum theory. Okay? So, it, uh, so basically, the structure of measurements constrains the structure of states. So this is the formal statement. So if you have a Hilbert space of dimension at least three, and you ask for a map from projections uh, on that Hilbert space to probabilities. So every projection is going to associate with some probability. So you want to say, what's the probability of this thing happening? Uh, which satisfies this additivity property for uh, mutually orthogonal projections, and furthermore uh, assigns the value one to the identity projection. Then uh, if you put these minimal constraints on this map, then essentially it has to be of this form where rho is your uh, quantum state. Okay, so that's the, the statement of the theorem, that if you start with the lattice of projections, require these two constraints on the probability valuations, then you basically get the quantum state out, okay? Um, the quotient specker theorem, so this is the second of the notions that apply to indivisible system systems, it says that the structure of measurements implies a constraint on the structure of states. So it doesn't give you the structure of states, but it says what the structure of states cannot be, okay? So it's a no-go theorem in that sense. And the formal statement is, is very similar to the previous one, except now it's about the non-existence of a certain map. Now, uh, instead of asking for a map from projections to probabilities, I'm asking for a map from projections to deterministic assignments of prob uh, deterministic probabilities, right? Zero or one. So you're saying whether a projection clicks or doesn't click. You're not saying that there's a probability. So you're asking, is, are there, is there a way to assign uh, such a map to projections which satisfy the same kinds of properties? So this additivity property and the identity gets one. The fact that such a thing doesn't exist, that's the content of the cochin specker theorem, okay? So you can prove it in various ways, but this is what you're trying to prove when you prove cochin specker theorem, okay? The non-existence of this map. 
Um, so it's easy to see that Gleason implies Cochin Specker because if I if I, the structure of measurements gives me the structure of states, then I know that you know uh, there's no quantum state that gives me deterministic outcomes on all possible measurements. So therefore, you know you, you cannot have uh, that map C because that has to be in particular quantum states, and there's no quantum states like that. So so Gleason implies Cochin Specker in that sense. Um, however, the reason people talk care about Cochin Specker is because you can prove it with a finite set of projections. So you can in Remember that in the statement of the theorem, you're using the full projection lattice for the, as the domain of your function. Uh, but you don't need to use that, the full lattice. You can just use a finite discrete set. Yeah? OK, so there in the literature, you can find broadly two types of proofs of the cochin specker theorem. The first is what, are, what we call logical proofs. So essentially, they, prove from, they proceed from a logical uh, contradiction. So just the mere structure of measurements is enough to prove them. So just the fact that the measurements, the projections have some orthogonal relations is enough to rule out the existence of the map C. The second is statistical proofs. These pr pr proceed from statistical violations of inequality. So these require the structure of states. So these are morally kind of the same as Bell experiments where you, uh, where the structure of the state is responsible for the correlations you see and you know, with a separable state you won't see Bell violations. So these are state dependent things. So these are statistical proofs. And here is an example of what a logical proof look, looks like. So here, uh, the vertices are, uh, for example, uh, four-dimensional projections, like on a, on a four-dimensional space. And it it's consists of 18 vectors, uh, which are carved up into nine different measurements. So this is the first measurement, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, uh, whatever, eighth, ah, whatever. It's, it's nine, nine edges, OK? The, the key point is that you cannot assign that define that map C that maps each of these vertices to a value 1 or 0. So if you try to color this in a way that uh, assignments of ones and zeros that add up to one for each loop, that's impossible. And one way to see that is that if you were to ask for such assignments, then there are nine measurements, so you need to assign at least nine assignments of one. However, each projection appears in two bases, so that means the number of ones has to be even. So an odd number cannot be an even number, so therefore you have a contradiction, and uh, that map C doesn't exist. Okay, so here's a no-go theorem, which uses a finite set of projections. Uh, here's a statistical proof where essentially now it's not a it's not that sort of a no-go theorem where you do not have any colorings. You do have colorings, but the colorings respect some uh, linear constraints. So these are, for example, the cochin specker inequalities, or uh, these are more mathematically the same thing as Bell inequalities, except now you can talk about for one a single system. Um, so here, for example, uh, if you try to look at deterministic assignments to these guys. None of them uh, can achieve a value greater than two for uh, these five vertices, three, four, five. Okay, so just just the, the main point is that it requires you to prepare a special state and do those measurements on them. Okay, um, and this is a more famous perhaps proof of the cochin specker theorem, which is about uh, assigning values to uh, um, two qubit uh, poly measurements and asking if you can make consistent value assignments. So you can also motivate it from the existence of that map C because uh, it kind of, in some sense, implicitly assumes the existence of that map C. I'm, I'll not do the translation. It's in the um, appendix of our paper if you want to look at it. But the point is that if, you want, if I want to assign a value to one of these operators, I assign either plus one or minus one, so something from the spectrum of that operator. Okay? And when I assign these valuations, if I assign a value to each of these operators, then the values assigned to them must respect the, uh, th these constraints. Okay? And these constraints follow from asking that, for example, the identity is assigned the value one because that's the eigenvalue there, right? So, um, so you, you get these constraints, and essentially there there exists no solution to this system of equations that is valued in plus one or minus one in the spectrum. Okay, so if you take the product of these guys, because each of these operators appears in two different commuting ah sorry, so the rows and columns here are commuting subsets of observables. And uh, each observable appears in two commuting subsets. And that's why each observable here will appear in two different equations. And uh, essentially, you have, uh, you have to respect these product relations. And so if you take the product on the left-hand side, you get plus one, because every term appears in two equations. On the right-hand side, you get a minus one. Um, and uh, so you know that there's no such solution. And this is, this is perez moment And one key thing to note is that perez moment requires entanglement. So if you were talking about measuring this, measuring these three observables together simultaneously, then the basis in which you measure them has to be the Bell basis, right? Like if the, you have to do the most fine-grained measurement you will do is the Bell basis, and you coarse-grain it to recover these three observables. 
Okay, that's what it means to do a joint measurement of these two in some sense. Um, so it requires entanglement, and we want to ask if this is just an accidental feature or if, it, if it's kind of systematic. So now we come to results. Um, the first result is the necessity of entangled measurements. So any logical proof of the Cochin-Speicher theorem on a multi-qubit system necessarily requires entangled measurements. So it's not an accidental property of the pairs Merman square, but in fact any such construction that you, which proves the non-existence of that map C, that deterministic map C, on a, multi, on a set of multi-qubit projections must include in the domain, like necessarily, the, uh, an entangled projection. Essentially, you, you cannot prove it with just product projections, okay? That's kind of the statement, that any logical proof requires uh, measurements in entangled bases. Uh, this is interesting partly also because, uh, unlike Bell, you have more measurements available to you, unentangled measurements available to you in, in a Cochin Specker setup, because in Bell you just do your local measurements and that's it. But in Cochin Specker, uh, there's no constraint on how these measurements are done. So you could include LOCC measurements, you could include the non-LOCC ones, uh, but still unentangled, but they don't offer any advantage over, over, over these uh, measurements in, in, in logical proofs of Cauchy Specker, okay? Um, so presence, so that's, that's what I meant. Uh, the presence of entanglement is not an accidental, it's uh, in fact necessary in any such n-qubit proof you might want to construct. Uh, the second statement is about statistical proofs of the Cauchy Specker theorem, which is that any statistical proof of uh, the theorem on a multi-qubit system, again, multi-qubit system is important, uh, with untangled measurements necessarily requires an entangled state, okay? So again, if you think of doing, preparing some multi-qubit state and doing some uh, measurements on it, um, unentangled measurements, they could be global but still have to be unentangled, um, it necessarily requires that you, the state must be entangled. Um, so that raises the question if entangled states are sufficient for such a proof, okay? Uh, so they're necessary but are they sufficient? And uh, the answer to that comes from this observation that, um, uh, so this is again uh, another result, which is that a multi-qubit entangled states will give you a statistical proof of the cochin specker theorem if and only if it'll vi it violates the Bell inequality. If, in fact, under just local measurements, you can violate a Bell inequality. Um, so it's an if and only if, uh, then, then uh, you know. So if you could, uh, yeah, so if you could have a statistical proof of the cochin specker theorem, it could have used global measurements, but it also means, uh, but that implies that there will be a corresponding Bell setup where you can just do local measurements and have a Bell inequality violation. So that's kind of the non-trivial direction of this. The other direction is kind of, just follows from the fact that Bell inequalities can be seen as a type of cochin specker inequality. Um, so since there exist mixed entangled states that don't violate Bell inequalities under projective measurements, the, because I'm only talking about projective measurements right now, uh, because cochin specker is formulated for them, uh, so therefore, entanglement is not sufficient for a statistical proof of cochin specker okay? So that's kind of why entanglement is not sufficient. Um, and we also map out um, the, how Gleason and the cochin specker theorem are related to each other. So uh, here, the first column is when uh, all your systems are Q-trits, so at least three-dimensional or higher. And we are only looking at unentangled projections. So in the domain of that function or that uh, F or the map C, we are only assuming that you have uh, unentangled projections now instead of the full projection lattice. And the question is, is that enough to constrain the probability rule to the quantum rule, right? Or, or to rule out the deterministic map C. Um, so for when, when you have q in um, uh, throughout, then uh, you, know, you know you can prove Gleason because you can prove it for a single q -trit. Obviously, you can prove it for many, many q -trits. And uh, Cochin Specker as well, you can prove this is all known. The purple stuff is what we kind of, in some sense, prove. The main result is really the third column where we show that Cochin Specker cannot be shown with unentangled uh, projections. And so therefore, you cannot prove Gleason with an unentangled projection. So basically, if you can't prove Cochin Specker, then you can't actually prove Gleason, okay? Because one implies the other. Gleason implies Cochin Specker. And this is, the, this is the kind of the mixed case where you have qubits throughout, but you may have some q and high-dimensional systems thrown in the middle. Uh, and there you cannot have Gleason with unentangled projections, but you can have cochin specker okay? And direct here just means that you just take product bases. That, that, that's what's meaning here. Um, okay, so those were like four observations about how these things are related. And the final observation is about 
how this says a little something about this model of quantum computing called quantum computation with state injection, where essentially you look at a set of, so this was proposed for Bravi and Kitaev, and essentially you take um, uh, uh, the stabilizer subtheory of quantum mechanics, so uh, stabilizer circuits, which you can efficiently classically simulate, and then you lift them to lift the circuit to universality by adding some uh, uh, sp special states called magic states in the literature. Uh, and an open question has been to figure out, you know, what characterizes these magic states. We know that they have to be non-stabilizer, but can we say more? Like, what kinds of non-stabilizer states are magic states? Um, and people have proposed answers to that question, so which these answers kind of underpin the claim that you may have heard that contextualizes the resource in these models. So, um, so this was kind of the paper that uh, led to a lot of uh, interest in this in this direction. So, um, where these authors they kind of showed that for odd prime dimensional qubits, q qubits, which they call quark bits. I don't know if the name really caught on, but that's what they used. Um, uh, it fails. Uh, so, so it works for quark bits. So it's true that you know your magic state must necessarily allow you to have a statistical proof of the cochinch packer theorem with stabilizer measurements. So, so with stabilizer measurements, it lets you prove the cochinch packer theorem. So that's the sense in which contextuality supplies the magic here. It's, it's kind of necessary, sufficiency is not known. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, but this fails for qubits, because if you have a multi-qubit system, you can have Perez moment squares, and, and that just uses the stabilizer sub-theory. So that already uses, has a lot of contextuality in it, but it seems to be useless contextuality, right? So, so for qubits, this claim fails. It works for odd prime dimensional qubits because there you cannot have uh, Perez moment type constructions with stabilizer measurements. So, um, so it fails for qubits because you have all this useless contextuality going on in the in the stabilizer circuit. So you can't really say that contextuality of the magic state is somehow special or is the resource. Uh, then there was this uh, modification that was proposed um, uh, for uh, uh, QCSI schemes with qubits which works for qubits, so now they prove that it is true that you know, any magic state you inject must have some contextuality with respect to stabilizer measurements, uh, but it requires some ad hoc restrictions. It basically, they have to modify the scheme, the general scheme of QSDSI, put some, impose some restrictions on it, and then they're able to show that the uh, input state must carry some contextuality, okay? Uh, these restrictions are designed in such a way that they rule out uh, the possibility of constructing logical proofs of the cochinch packer theorem using just stabilizer measurements, okay? So they, they seem ad hoc because they basically amount to just saying that there exists a state w uh, without contextuality with respect to available measurements in the scheme. That's kind of the general uh, restriction they put. So when you put this uh, um, uh, restriction, it just basically m it means that there exists a state which is non-contextual with respect to all measurements kind of thing. And if you have a Perez moment construction, then there's no such state, right? So this, this kind of, by fiat rules out that construction. So now when you actually look at the scheme that they, they propose a constructive scheme, if you look at the paper and you look at the constructive scheme, it essentially amounts to uh, no entangled measurements in the proposed scheme. So the, the, the scheme doesn't allow you to do any entangled measurements. All the entanglement is actually in the magic states. When they, so they use also entangled magic states. That's the other difference. Um, so that's this paper. And so, so this obviously tells you that, like, you know, so the, the, our theorem gives you a reason to sort of impose, uh, so instead of this restriction, I could just say this is, this is sufficient for this to be true, right? Like if I don't allow entangled measurements in my scheme, then I'm not gonna have, uh, then I'm gonna satisfy this property. So this is another, uh, a more foundational reason why you may want to look at these schemes because they kind of, uh, you know, it so happens that the construction doesn't carry entanglement, but there's more fundamental reasons to have this property, okay? So that's kind of the takeaway. I believe I'm in time, yeah, okay. So I started with the connection between uh, notions of non-classicality for composite systems and indivisible systems. Uh, so the yellow arrows here is basically stuff that's known. So from Bell's theorem to, uh, we know that Bell's theorem implies entanglement. You need entangled states to have Bell's theorem, right? Uh, we know Gleason's theorem also requires entanglement. So, so this was a known result that, uh, I didn't mention this in the talk, but essentially the fact that in order to prove Gleason's theorem for multi-qubit systems, your domain must include entangled projections. You cannot do it without entangled projections. We recover that as a consequence of our result, because if there's no quotient specter, there's no Gleason. But this was independently known in the literature from the early 2000s. 
So this was known. Uh, Gleason implies quotient specter is also kind of it's simple to observe once you see the what the statements of the theorems are. That's what I tried to explain. And what we show is that a quotient specter for multi-qubit systems requires entanglement. So for logical proofs, it requires entangled measurements. For statistical proofs, it requires entangled states. Statistical proofs with unentangled measurements, it requires entangled states. And uh, and and also that you know you can you can have statistical proofs of the quotient specter theorem with unentangled measurements, uh, if and only if you also have a proof of Bell's theorem with just local measurements on on some state, uh, on the same state. So now we just take the contrapositives, okay, so, and then we get all the conclusions I was trying to make. So. Uh, the fact that there's no entanglement, if I exclude entanglement in composite systems, that explains restrictions on, on those schemes that were proposed by um, Bermejo Vega et al. And uh, so because, because that rules out the ferrous moment type, uh, possibility of ferrous moment constructions in your uh, restricted stabilizer circuit. And, uh, and, this, and this connection means that the magic states that you use in, in these kinds of schemes, which do not allow entangled measurements, must, so all your measurements, even if they're global or adaptive, must be unentangled. Uh, they must carry uh, entanglement, right? They, they must violate, in fact, not only carry entanglement, but they must violate Bell inequalities. So, so that's another um, uh, constraint on, on these schemes that they, yeah. So that's the sense in which uh, um, the, the resource aspects of contextuality, at least for multi-qubit systems, are also related to resource aspects of Entanglement in this uh, in this fairly uh, qualitative sense because I didn't use any measures or anything. It's just logical relations between the different concepts. And yeah, thank you. Uh, you can check our paper for more details on this. start with the first one, which I'm concerned about it. Uh, so can you expand a little bit on this problem of uh, contextuality with qubits and cu qubits? Like why is this really require different tools? I, I, I think I didn't get this. You mean uh, qubits as opposed to other systems? Higher yes, dimensions? Yes, qubits as opposed to other systems. Why, why this? Yeah. Bec was it because the cohen specter theorem doesn't work for D equal to? Yeah, that's the reason. That's the main reason. Yeah, yeah. The reason is because there you can write down a, a classical model, deterministic model. Mm -hmm. For projections on a qubit, this is what Kochen and proposed oh, themselves, yeah, yeah. and um, and so yeah, so you can you can have that map C basically for for, mm -hmm. for qubit mm -hmm. projections, okay. Okay, but you I cannot see. have it for qubit projections. I see, I see, I see. And so in some sense, it's kind of intuitive that you're going to need some entanglement if you have two qubits to to have the uncoverability. Yeah. All right, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? I'm gonna ask another one then. Go ahead. <laughs> let's, let's go to this Mervyn square. So you said with the Mervyn square that you have to have entanglement there. So I was just wondering, because I, when I first watch, looked at the Mervyn square, I didn't really think that this is two qubits. You could think that this is a four dimensional system, sure, right? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so does it mean that like, if I take this four dimensional system, I take any bipartition, I have to have entanglement? Or is it just with this bipartition? Like, what's the statement really? I mean, uh, four, uh, I mean, Two qubit system, four dimensional. I mean, two yeah. by two is the only division, no, right? No, so no. I mean, well, no. I mean, I guess you can divide it differently, right? I mean, um, okay. Local, those are the only locally, factors. Locally, <laughs> yeah, you can locally have some unitaries, right? Yeah. You can. Yeah. It's not the only way. I mean, you can mm -hmm. you can divide it in different ways. Yeah. So I'm just wondering oh. whether this whether this entanglement is necessary in this particular basis that you when you, that you write the operator. I mean, I'm I'm assuming that that the that whatever state I'm writing down it can be understood as an n qubit state. Okay. If uh, or n qubit measurements. Okay. So I'm assuming that I'm okay, assuming okay. this composite character of the thing because uh, if you if you wanted to say it in a way that doesn't assume this composite character, mm -hmm. then that requires a more general theorem which which we don't have. This assumes okay. a composite uh, like a certain uh, yeah, certain factorization, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, all right, last moment to ask, I know we are all hungry, uh, but any, uh, maybe hungry for knowledge, do you want to ask a question? <laughs> no, not today, okay, thanks, uh, let's thank okay, the speaker and thank also you. the all speakers of the today's session. Thank you.